A number of things happen here at the opening of chapter 7. The first thing to notice is the character of Lydia and Kitty. Both Lydia and Kitty are these very flighty young girls, very young, 14, 15 year old girls, and they like men who are in uniform, colorful, flashy men. They don't like men for a character, for the type of man that they're looking for. They just like any man in uniform. Um, it's a bit like a Teen Beat magazine or young girls uh, falling in love with Justin Bieber or something like that. Uh, these are flighty young girls who really are setting themselves up for great disaster later on because they haven't thought through what makes a good relationship or a good friendship for that matter. Consequently, Mr. Bennett says that they're very silly, but he doesn't do anything notice to help them or stop them or to improve their imaginative world. Mr. Bennett therefore falls down on the job of being a father and he allows his daughters to be silly because he doesn't want to have anything to do with them. He is aloof from such silliness and retreats back to his cave, his little room full of books. But that leaves the daughters exposed to possible damage later on and danger later on. All the characters in this opening then are contributing to an ongoing theme that Jane Austen is developing which is the, uh, the pride and the prejudice that each character exhibits which limits them or keeps them contained in their small world, their small vision. This limitation is seen in the article by Mark Shore entitled Pride Unprejudiced. Shore says, Every character, however entertaining in himself, however important to the mechanical plot, has a further function. Every character is in some important way integrated in the theme of the novel, so that the novel presents us with a various and full and finally exact dramatic analysis of that theme. In other words, all the characters are all the time pointing not out or away from but directly at the very center of the whole. See all the characters, as Shore points out, exist in the story as what we call foils opposites to what the correct way of acting should be. They all of them point to that same theme of pride and prejudice. The main characters of Darcy and Elizabeth are constantly seen in the light of all these other characters, Mr. Bennet, Mrs. Bennet, Kitty, Lydia, Jane, even Mary. Uh, they're seen in light of Bingley or they're seen in light of, of Mrs. Hurst. Uh, all these different characters are contrasting to Elizabeth and to Darcy and they highlight therefore the problem, the issue of pride and prejudice. Part of the issue of pride is that it leaves other people exposed and that's what Mr. Bennett does here. And into that conversation of the silliness of Lydia and Kitty comes this letter suddenly which is inviting Jane to go and visit over at the Bingleys. This, in some ways, draws Jane out of her little world, her little family world of bickering that goes on between Mr. and Mrs. Bennet. And that's a good thing. But immediately we see in Mrs. Bennet a form of contrivance, where she attempts to get her daughter in a situation where she has more chance with Mr. Bingley. This is what Mrs. Bennet says when the invitation comes to dine at the Bingley's house. You had better go on horseback, because it seems likely to rain, and then you must stay all night. That would be a good scheme, said Elizabeth, if you were sure that they would not offer to send her home. Oh, but the gentlemen will have Mr. Bingley's chaise to go to Meryton, and the hearse have no horses to theirs. I had much rather go in the coach, says Jane. But my dear, your father cannot spare the horses, I am sure. They are wanted in the farm, Mr. Bennet, are they not? They are wanted in the farm much oftener than I can get them, says Mr. Bennet. But if you have got them today, says Elizabeth, my mother's purpose will be answered. She did at last extort from her father an acknowledgment that the horses were engaged. Jane was therefore obliged to go on horseback, and her mother attended her to the door with many cheerful prognostics of a bad day. Her hopes were answered. Jane had not been gone long before it had rained hard. Her sisters were uneasy for her, but her mother was delighted. Notice here Mrs. Bennet, with her scheming to get her daughters married, is delighted because Jane now has to stay at the Bingleys and will have more chance of seeing Mr. Bingley and maybe more chance of getting married. Her whole movement of thought is to get her daughters married and consequently the, her character uh, contributes to the possibility of Elizabeth getting out of her small world because Jane goes to the Bingleys and gets stuck there because she gets sick and Elizabeth finds herself obliged to have to go and help her sister and out of this movement of spirit of trying to help another person she's forced to leave her little world 
and she goes off on sort of a journey, a, an adventure, where she has to experience the world of the Bingleys. Well, this world of the Bingleys is not necessarily a nice place. And in the next chapter, when she goes to visit, she goes to visit and she has several conversations with the Bingleys and, of course, with Mr. Darcy, who is visiting, which reveal a great deal of the stalwartness of Elizabeth's character, but also reveal a great deal about the world of gossip and talk and expectations into which Elizabeth has entered. In this world, in chapter 8, they are discussing the nature of women and what women should be like. And, of course, Mr. Bingley, who is weighing in first, says this of women. Yes, all of them are accomplished, I think. They all paint tables, cover screens, net purses. I scarcely know anyone who cannot do all this, and I am sure I never heard a young lady spoken of for the first time without being informed that she was very accomplished. Bingley's opinion of women is of course, flighty and, and uh, humorous. and He's kind of laughing at the idea that all these women seem to be accomplished women. They do all these wonderful things. But there's very little substance in the, the speech of Bingley about women. Uh, he's talking about a surface-level appearance of women. And Darcy objects to this. Your list of the common extent of accomplishments, said Darcy, has too much truth. The word is applied to many a woman who deserves it, no otherwise than by netting a purse or covering a screen. But I am very far from agreeing with you in your estimation of ladies in general. I cannot boast of knowing more than half a dozen in the whole range of my acquaintance that are really accomplished. No, I, I am sure, said Miss Bingley. Darcy's objecting to the whole use of the term accomplished, which normally means a woman who is well-rounded, who is a wealthy, who is good-looking, who has all these things at her disposal. She's got a great resume. Her curriculum vitae is uh, greatly beefed up. But Darcy suggests that that's not real accomplishment in his imagination. It's not a good woman. He's never met a woman who's actually a decent woman. He's met women who are this accomplished, overachieving type, much like Miss Bingley. But he's never met a woman of real substance, a woman that he actually could say is a decent human being. And that's confirmed by the fact that right at the end of his speech, Miss Bingley says, no, I've never met that either. Oh, I am an accomplished woman, Miss Bingley thinks. But I've never met anybody else who is. And Darcy, recognizing that Miss Bingley herself is a gold digger, doesn't respond. But notice who does respond is Elizabeth. She says, Then you must comprehend a great deal in your idea of an accomplished woman. Yes, I do comprehend a great deal in it, says Darcy. Oh, certainly, cried his faithful assistant, Bingley. No one can be really esteemed accomplished who does not greatly surpass what is usually met with. A woman must have a thorough knowledge of music, singing, drawing, dancing in the modern languages to deserve the word. And besides all this, she must possess a certain something in her air and manner of walking, the tone of her voice, her address, and expressions, or the word will be but half deserved. All this she must possess, added Darcy, and to all this she must yet add something more substantial in the improvement of her mind by extensive reading. I am no longer surprised at your knowing only six accomplished women, I rather wonder now at your knowing any, said Elizabeth. Darcy here is being very cynical, I think. He's suggesting, now, you know, we, you're right, Bingley. We need, she needs all those things to be really accomplished, and she must be a strong reader, and no woman is capable of this. Darcy seems to recognize that no woman is capable of it. And yet, what he's destined to be married to is an accomplished woman. Everybody expects him to be married to an accomplished woman. And he thinks this is an impossible task to uphold. It, it, it's not possible for any human being to do all these things and still be human, truly human. And that's why Elizabeth then says, I, I, I'm surprised you know only six. I'm surprised you know any at all to be able to maintain that standard. And there's a bit of tension here between Darcy and Elizabeth. In fact, Darcy, you could say, comes across as almost a threatening character, almost a dangerous character. He certainly, Fitzwilliam Darcy, is certainly a man who has a dark past. He's recently lost his father, so he's dealing with that loss, that tragedy. He's inherited the whole wealth of his estate. He has to deal with all that. And he himself is a brooding, dark character. This is a character which, in literature, we refer to as a Byronic figure. It's a figure who has a brooding, dark past, who has uh, all the uh, facilities at his disposal of, of intellect and breeding and wealth, and yet is himself very dark. Sarah Wooten, in her article, The Byronic in Jane Austen's Persuasion and Pride and Prejudice, says this, 
Pride is an ubiquitous trait of the Byronic hero. And just as Byron's Manfred is found wanting when compared with the humble virtue of the Shemois hunter, so the people of Meryton remain unimpressed by Darcy's high and imposing manners. Darcy's birthright, his high rank in society, does not automatically entail a noble character. Darcy betrays a bitterness of temper that lends credence to Wickham's account of his malicious revenge and inhumanity. Certainly it is Darcy's pride that creates Elizabeth's prejudice. Elizabeth's suspicions about Darcy's scandalous behavior seem to be confirmed by his treatment of her angelic sister, for which no adequate explanation is ever given. For the reader to accept Darcy as a worthy partner for Elizabeth, Jane Austen must, as Henrietta Ten Harmsell states, change the initially villainous aristocratic hero into an acceptable husband for the victorious heroine. So Darcy in this chapter comes across as brooding and dark and almost villainous. He himself is very critical of women because he's never known good women, decent women. He's only known accomplished women. And that accomplishment he seems to see as plastic, as, as fake. All these women who are so accomplished and want his money that they don't have a shred of humanity left in them. But this conversation between Elizabeth and Darcy sets the tension between them. Remember that Darcy has be begun to fall in love with Elizabeth, noticing her eyes and noticing certain aspects of her character that he really admires. And Elizabeth herself has, doesn't want anything to do with Darcy because he's so proud, she thinks. The two of them, though, are drawn together almost by the power of their spirit, the fire of their spirit, the, the, the same critical nature that both of them are beginning to cultivate in the story. In chapter 9, that relationship is complicated by the very fact that Elizabeth's mother and sisters come to visit. And here she's mortified by the fact that her family is so embarrassing, especially embarrassing in the presence of Mr. Darcy. Her mother, though, reveals a certain prejudice particularly against Darcy, that is particularly painful for Elizabeth to deal with. The country, said Darcy, can in general supply but a few subjects for such a study. In a country neighborhood, you move in a very confined and unvarying society. But people themselves alter so much that there is something new to be observed in them forever, says Elizabeth. Yes, indeed, cried Mrs. Bennet, offended by his manner of mentioning a country neighborhood. I assure you, there is quite as much of that going on in the country as in town. Everybody was surprised, and Darcy, after looking at her for a moment, turned silently away. Mrs. Bennet, who fancied she had gained a complete victory over him, continued her triumph. I cannot see that London has any great advantage over the country. For my part, I at the shops and public places. The country is a vast deal pleasanter, is it not, Mr. Bingley? When I'm in the country, he replied, I never wish to leave it. And when I'm in town, it's pretty much the same. <laughs> they have each their advantages, and I can be equally happy in either. Aye, that's because you have the right disposition. But that gentleman, she said, looking at Darcy, seemed to think the country was nothing at all. Mrs. Bennet is immediately prejudiced against Darcy because of her earlier experience with him at the ball, and because of his mentioning Jane. And yet... This prejudice prevents her from being even civil to the man, seeing anything good in the man. And so Elizabeth tries to contradict her mother, and she says, Indeed, Mama, you're mistaken. You quite mistook Mr. Darcy. He only meant that there was not such a variety of people to be met with in the country as in the town, which you must acknowledge to be true. Certainly, my dear, nobody said there were. But as to not meeting with many people in this neighborhood, I believe there are a few neighborhoods larger. I know we dine with four and twenty families. Mrs. Bennet, who thinks that her world of four and twenty is very large, has no concept of the real immensity of wealth and of power and, and, and of experience that Darcy and the Bingleys have. And it's embarrassing to Elizabeth to see for the first time, outside of her little world, how embarrassing her mother is to her. Darcy noticed, though, is much greater sold than to simply be turned off completely by the insults of Elizabeth's mother. And further on in that same conversation, they move to talking about poetry and the nature of poetry. And here Elizabeth says that poetry has a habit of killing a love. Poetry in general is uh, described as being an, an avenue for, for creating love and, and making love grow. But Elizabeth seems to recognize that that's only true if the love is already deep. It nourishes what's already growing. And I think Darcy clues into this. This woman doesn't simply say, Poetry is beautiful. It's so cute. Puppies and butterflies and poems about rainbows. Elizabeth seems to think of love 
as something much more profound, and as poetry as something much more profound. And that again makes Darcy see her differently than he's seen any other woman before, and his love grows even further. But the conversation ends with Lydia and Kitty again embarrassing their sister by asking for a ball. I'm perfectly ready, I assure you, to keep my engagement. When your sister is recovered, you shall, if you please, name the very day of the ball. But you would not wish to be dancing when she is ill. Lydia declared herself satisfied. Oh, yes, it would be much better to wait till Jane knows well. By that time, most likely, Captain Carter would be at Meryton again. And when you have given your ball, she added, I shall insist on their giving one also. I shall tell Colonel Forster it will be quite a shame if he does not. Mrs. Bennet and her daughters then departed, and Elizabeth returned instantly to Jane, leaving her own and her relations' behavior to the remarks of the two ladies and Mr. Darcy, the latter of whom, however, could not be prevailed on to join in their censure of her, in spite of all Miss Bingley's witticisms on fine eyes. So at the conclusion of this embarrassing moment, the Bennets go home and Elizabeth retreats in almost shock to see her bedridden sister. But Darcy doesn't join in crit criticizing her afterwards. And it's a sign, a subtle sign, but it's a sign that Darcy is falling even more deeply in love with Elizabeth.